Economic ties between the United States and Cuba have grown significantly in the last 10 years in spite of the decades-long U.S. embargo and associated legislation. In agricultural trade and farm sales, since the implementation of the Trade Sanctions Reform and Export Enhancement Act of 2000, the value of Cuban agricultural imports from the United States more than tripled, increasing from approximately 550 million in 2000 to more than 1.8 billion in 2008. Between 2006 and 2008, overall agricultural imports increased more than 70 percent. Indeed, since 2003, the United States has supplied more agricultural products annually to Cuba than any other country, accounting for 35 percent of all Cuban agricultural imports during two, between 2003 to 2008. In terms of tourism, Experts observe that the elimination of current restrictions on U.S. travel to Cuba could boost annual U.S. tourism-related visits to anywhere between 500,000 to a million visitors, in the process providing a boost to important segments of the U.S. travel industry and regional economies, and in the process changing the landscape of the Caribbean tourism industry altogether. These figures and supporting claims have produced an important debate about the benefits and problems in an economic relationship between the United States and Cuba. The Obama administration has taken a variety of measures designed to ease family travel and remittances to Cuba, as promised in the Obama presidential campaign. But the administration has also allowed, for instance, for technology, or te uh, I beg your pardon, telecommunications companies to apply for licenses to do business in Cuba. Additionally, legislation has been moving in Congress, for, in for instance, H.R. 4645, to ease agricultural sales to Cuba by eliminating the cash in advance provision still required for all such sales to Cuba's sell import, as well as eliminating travel restrictions. Some restrictions on travel, on cultural travel and exchange have also been recently eased, allowing for more Cuban artists to come to the United States. In spite of these developments, uh, important considerations remain as to the advantages and so-called opportunities of doing business in Cuba. For instance, in an April 29 hearing precisely on H.R. 4645, uh, Representative Kevin Brady, Republican ranking member of the House, and Ways, uh, ha um, House Ways and Means Subcommittee on Trade, said that U.S. telecommunications companies have not yet rushed in because, in their view, the costs and risks of dealing with the Cuban regime outweigh any mar marginal economic benefit. Brady said the economic climate in Cuba was intolerant of U.S. firms. Moreover, important questions about human and labor rights in Cuba remain, raising serious challenges and issues for U.S. companies attempting to do business in the island. There's no accord on U.S. property claims against Cuba, both individual and corporate, which could potentially raise a variety of obstacles to business transactions. These different concerns raise questions about what agenda for business in Cuba ought to look like, taken into consideration the advantages and pitfalls of such a relationship. To shed light on this important debate, we're delighted to have with us a distinguished panel of experts who will give us the reading of the issues on the table and the policy alternatives. Um, to my left, and you have a speaker bio, so I won't go into uh, a lot of detail about them, but to my left, we have Christopher Sabatini, Policy Director for the Council of the Americas. We have Professor Jose Acel, uh, from the Center for Cuban and Cuban American Studies at the University of Miami. We have Bill Reinsch, uh, President of the National Foreign Trade Council and Co-Director of the USA Engage Coalition. And we have Jorge Piñon, a Visiting Research Fellow at the Cuban Research Institute at Florida University of Miami. My name is Jose Raul Perales and I am the Senior Program Associate in the Latin American Program here at the Wilson Center. Um, with that, I leave the floor to uh, my colleague Chris Sabatini. Please. Thank you. How long do I have to speak? Or just 15, 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. I was going to give a caster length speech <laughs> of about three hours, but I guess I'll trim it a bit. The, um, hey, I'm going to be speaking um, <coughs> primarily on a personal uh, behalf. Uh, we at the Council of the Americas, America Society, chair a Cuba working group, which <coughs> comprises a number of our uh, member companies. We have 190 plus member companies. Uh, that span sectors from telecommunications to tourism to insurance and banking and finance. Um, what I'm going to say draws partially from our work uh, with that Cuba Working Group, but is also in part uh, uh, personal opinion. I'll leave it to you to decide which is which. Um, first of all, I would say that I think uh, I want to applaud uh, Cynthia and Woodrow Wilson Center for putting this together because I do think the debate on the embargo has uh, been often uh, misframed. And I think it's had a very distorting effect on uh, the real issues on Cuba um, in several ways. First of all, um, 
it has had a tendency to sort of pit two people, pro and con, um, in the embargo. And obviously, uh, one side's winning and the other one's losing. Um, but second, it also serves as a huge distraction uh, on what is one of the central issues. Whether we agree or not that the embargo is going to do anything about it is another matter. But that is human rights in Cuba. And even by you know, modern standards, the human rights uh, in Cuba today are abysmal. Um, there are over 200 political prisoners. Um, for people can be arrested for issues of dangerousness, which can include things like freedom of association, or can violate freedom of association. Um, there are strict limits on freedom of expression, and Cuba is in violation of several core ILO uh, labor agreements. So again, a discussion of either or the embargo tends to obscure that. But the third issue is that really, <coughs> If you look at countries where embargoes have been taken down, whether it's Vietnam or other countries, it hasn't happened as a straight up or down vote uh, in Congress. Um, it hasn't happened simply by having a group of, in all due respect to all of us here, and I consider myself among them, a group of uh, advocates or policy specialists in Washington uh, make a case to Congress for the reasons for why an embargo should come down. How it has traditionally happened, uh, Vietnam is a good case in point, is that there have been slight regulatory changes over time within the embargo that have basically served to hollow it out. And that in time, when the time comes, it makes it much easier because the momentum, the constituency, and even the profit incentives for tearing down the embargo are, are much easier uh, to recognize and are much more mobilized. Uh, I would venture, and I think the, the, uh, the failure of the uh, uh, telecommute, of the uh, travel uh, lifting that just happened in Congress is a perfect example of why, uh, when it comes to lift the embargo, people who try to do it with all the best intentions, uh, without framing it first as human rights, without, frame, and without framing it in terms of economic uh, regulatory issues, are, are losing, to be quite frank. Um, but in this light, uh, what I would say is actually, first of all, is I think any discussion of the embargo and economic relations um, needs to really keep at the front of uh, the burner. The fact that the embargo is there, whether we like it or not, for reasons of human rights. And we need to realize that when we discuss the embargo, it's not in changing it, and I do believe we're mistaken if we see the embargo as monolithic. When we discuss how to sort of flexibilize, if I can use that as a verb, the embargo, we need to recognize that it's not a zero-sum game, which is the way both sides have often fallen into the trap. Those pro-embargo believe that even tinkering with it means that you are akin to a human rights abuser, and those on the other side who believe that you may want to work within it uh, could sometimes be a case of, of just willing to tolerate what is perhaps a, an unworkable policy. The question really is, though, is understanding sort of what, is, what are specific changes within the embargo um, in which, yes, the regime may benefit in some ways. Uh, cultural, educational exchanges, human-to-human -human contact is one that uh, the regime can benefit in some ways. It certainly dictates who gets to travel from Cuba to the United States. But you need to look at sort of the, the <coughs> net effects of that. And I would argue that the net effects of increasing human-to-human -human contact between Cuba and the United States are that actually independent voices within the, the <coughs> society win. So I think we, you know, in, in discussing this, we need to recognize what are the spaces, but what are the net gains um, in terms of human rights, but in terms of also our economic relations. The second point is that, again, accepting whether we like it or not the fact that the embargo exists and is really a, an act of law, uh, in many ways it may even violate our Constitution by taking away our executive pr prerogatives or foreign policy, um, the changes that are going to occur really uh, are in regulation. If there's a broad amount of scope for regulatory changes that can allow for U.S. businesses and other sorts of uh, institutional actors to begin to develop closer relationships inside Cuba. And that's, that, I think, is where the action and our focus um, should be uh, in looking for the scope for change, much the way uh, embargoes in other places and other countries have been uh, affected. And uh, in this area, I think the two, uh, the, there are two specific sectors that sort of meet both of these criteria. The first being, again, the need to re recognize that any change needs to strengthen the hand of independent sectors within Cuba, needs to be justified, and needs to basically be balanced with our concerns for human rights. But the second one is, is ones that are within the scope of the executive's regulatory authority. There are two. One is telecommunications, and the second is, is uh, uh, travel, um, not, but not lifting the wholesale travel ban. Telecommunications. As many of you know, on April 13th, President Obama last year uh, issued a regulatory change on telecommunications, arguing uh, that he was going to allow for greater private sector activity for investments in telecommunications 
uh, to be able to strengthen uh, the ability of Cubans to be able to communicate uh, outside the island and to gain access uh, to independent sources of information. Subsequently, uh, OFAC and uh, Treasury Department of Commerce issued uh, reg the regulations September 3rd and September 8th. Um, but when you look closely at these regulations, um, it is a classic example of uh, either uh, bad intentions that uh, have been acted on and, and all their bad intention, or good intentions that somehow when they squirted out of the sausage-making machine apparatus of the bureaucracy, ended up uh, doing not, nothing of what President Obama wanted to do. Um, the first is President Obama talked about establishing a fiber optic cable with the island. And second, again, he talked about establishing the means for Cubans to be able to communicate privately. What the regulations strictly prohibit are, are equipment transfers or sales to the island for commercial purposes. Here's the problem. In, able, in order to be able to communicate with Cubans on the island, you need to be able to sell things to them so they can do it. You need cell phone towers, you need routers, you need handsets, you need switchers, and that fiber optic cable, it's not a toaster. You don't just sort of drag it all the way to Cuba and plug it into Havana. It requires a whole set of licenses that have to occur in terms of equipment that we have to transfer there. Those are not provided for in the regulations. And to quote someone from BIS in the Commerce Department, when we brought together a group of telecommunications companies to ask them, and there was a lot of interest in this at first, we asked them, so what's new about this? He says, the only difference here really is that it allows uh, telecommunications executives to travel to Cuba for the purpose of doing business. That's the only difference. In other words, a lot of fanfare, <coughs> not much happened. And so consequently, I do still believe, um, let me also say, cite another anecdote about how completely uh, short this, this measure fell. Um, one of our co member companies wanted to be able to sell pre prepaid cell phone cards with cell phones on the island. Um, the Treasury Department actually said that they couldn't do that unless they could determine that anyone on the receiving end, the buying end, was not a Cuban government official or a member of the Cuban Communist Party. Um, that's, of course, ridiculous because you can't actually determine who's going to be the end user before you deliver the phones. But also what's ridiculous about this is across the developed world or developing world, prepaid <coughs> cell phones and cell phone cards are the primary means that the poor and the disenfranchised have been able to communicate and have gotten access to mobile cell te technology. It hasn't been, and you know, let's be honest, Raul and, and Fidel Castro, if they even knew, know how to operate a cell phone given their uh, age, um, they aren't worry, waiting for a prepaid cell phone to land in their laps. Um, these things primarily will provide the means and tools for communication from cu for Cubans to communicate with their relatives and to communicate with the outside island. They're far outside the perks and the benefits of the regime. The second issue in which there's a fair amount of, let me conclude that by saying it, in this case in particular, all it requires is an executive stroke of the pen. Moreover, all it requires, to be honest, is President Obama to meet and comply with his own goals in his stated announcement on April 13th. And that would require allowing telecommunications companies with all the concerns for dual use and the need for licensing to be able to sell for uh, export equipment to the island. Second, hospitality. The travel, lifting the travel ban was unceremoniously uh, uh, overturned or sort of killed uh, at the end of last year, earlier this year. Um, but I still believe there's a fair amount of potential for being able to make regulatory changes that can increase the sort of commercial and economic activity around the growing number of U.S. visitors we have going to the island. Um, the numbers change. I won't cite these with any, uh, any uh, certainty, but people are saying that upwards of 200,000 Cuban Americans are traveling to the island now. Um, and then now with the uh, expanded and expanding uh, potential for uh, educational and cultural exchanges, people are saying that by... Uh, in two years, up to half a million American citizens, Cuban Americans and non-Cuban American citizens, will be traveling the island. <coughs> Under the embargo, what does that, this mean? It means they can't use their credit cards, they don't have ATM access, can't use their cell phones, they don't have access to U.S. medicines, and they don't have access to U.S. insurance should something happen. Traveler's insurance, medical insurance, all those things. Um, in other words, it's actually questionable whether it's legitimate to be able to allow American citizens to be able to travel to a country in which they're so completely disconnected. Again, what can be done? Um, in all these cases, there can be greater scope for financial activities, basically <coughs> for credit card companies to allow, uh, U.S.-issued US credit card companies to allow their cards to be accepted in the United States. In Cuba, it's just a flick of the switch. Um, they'd be gaining profit. You'd be empowering U.S. citizens. You may actually even be empowering uh, Cuban independent uh, providers and Cuban independent uh, uh, um, 
uh, service providers. Um, the second is insurance. Um, not coincidentally, when the U.S. was debating the, uh, the lifting of the uh, travel ban, uh, MapFree, the Spanish insurance company, its stock shot through the roofs. Uh, they know exactly uh, what this is all about, and this means that when people travel, they want uh, to be able to have access to travel insurance. Um, unfortunately, it's, the benefits will go to outsiders. Um, now, in all these cases, as I say, these are cases in which the U.S. executive can tackle the embargo, can I even say this, weaken the embargo, but in which even, again, I believe that the benefits to Cuban freedom outweigh the costs <coughs> or the benefits to the regime or the cost to U.S. policy. Travel, by increasing travel to Cuba, I'm sorry, we're not talking about cruise ships unloading thousands of, of Bermuda short clad, camera wearing, Hawaiian shirt wearing executives to uh, basically buy in the gift shops of Cuba. We're talking about in cultural and educational exchanges, U.S. citizens going to the island to be able to learn and meet with other Cubans. When it comes to Cuban Americans, we're talking about allowing them to reconnect with their fellow citizens. If we can give them the scope to be able to also, the economic scope, to be able to meaningfully engage in those exchanges and be able to facilitate that, I actually believe it's downright unconscionable that we're not doing it. Similarly, in the area of, of telecommunications, we simply have failed in the way the regulations were sort of spat out of uh, our bureaucracy, <laughs> have failed to comply and meet with President Obama's goals for providing Cubans. I, I honestly, this is not for economic reasons, um, but I think this is a travesty. So let me conclude. In terms of economic relations, uh, which is the topic of this panel, there are very little. Um, there's been some back and forth among telecommunications companies going to the island now with their expanded license to be able to do so. But the signals they've received from regulators and the U.S. government have been very chilling. Um, jumping through a whole series of hoops, um, being told that the changes really are quite insignificant. Um, and in hospitality, uh, the, the doubling down on the U.S. lifting the congressional ban certainly failed. But again, I think there's scope for improvement there. Um, I think that this is one of those areas that we can see ways that we, by empowering our own private sector, by uh, recognizing in specific areas, not a wholesale lifting the embargo, but in specific areas, by allowing them greater scope for activity, we actually can further both U.S. economic interests in narrow ways, but more importantly, independence inside Cuba. And most importantly, by doing that, I think we lay the groundwork for the long-term uh, transition that I think we all want to see in Cuba, um, which unfortunately has been hamstrung by, by an interpretation and debate that imputes the embargo an excessively, uh, excessive amount of inflexibility. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Jose? Thank you. And good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank you for being part of this important debate. Given that the title of this conference is the United States and Cuba Implications for an Economic Relationship, I think it is fitting that we examine a little bit more critically the underlying quite generalized notion that a post-Castro Cuba implies a business bonanza for American companies. From this notion, it is often suggested that American companies will rush to invest in a post-embargo Cuba. <clears throat> I am going to argue that we really need to significantly lower our expectations regarding U.S. foreign direct investment, FDI, in Cuba. And I'm going to do so uh, from a scholarly perspective for the moment, staying away from all the policy arguments, and we, we can certainly get into that in, in the Q&A session. So to comply with, with that uh, criterion, let us begin by making the <coughs> heroic, and it's a truly heroic assumption, that the Castro brothers are out of the picture, that a smooth transition is taking place in Cuba, that Cuba is moving towards a democratization of the country, towards a free market economy, towards a low base state, and a growing civil society, and all the other components that we normally associate with a successful transition. And I think everyone in this room would agree that those are indeed heroic 
assumption. But let us assume that that, that, that is indeed the case. And, and to be clear, I am not referring about American companies exporting their goods to Cuba. Indeed, companies will seek to export their goods and services to Cuba, provided, of course, that they can get paid. And that is another question that we can tackle. But from a corporate point of view, <coughs> exporting is typically the lower risk, lower cost way of serving the market. And companies will seek to export if that option is indeed available to them. It is an option that in the case of Cuba will be perceived with extremely high financial, business, and political risk given the history of U.S. investments in Cuba. But American companies will seek to export to Cuba. But exports do not directly contribute the technology transfers, the expertise, the capital requirements that a post-Castro Cuba will indeed in, uh, require. So we're going to focus for a moment on foreign direct investments rather than, than exporting. And to appreciate why I am arguing that companies will not rush to invest in Cuba, it is important to understand why companies engage in foreign <coughs> direct investment in the first place, given that exporting to a market is indeed a simpler, less costlier, and uh, less riskier proposition. Generally, international business, and, and I suppose we have some, some international uh, economists here, but international economics looks at the act of foreign direct investment in a rather aggregate fashion. It, they, international economists look at the act. The discipline of international business, which, which I, is part of my, my uh, background, looks not so much at the act of foreign direct investment, but at the <coughs> actors making those investments. The point is that countries do not export, countries do not invest, companies do. So if we sort of shift our analytical focus from a nation state to a more specific, company-specific approach, and we ask, why do companies invest overseas? And then try to answer that question in the context of Cuba. Admittedly, this is going to be an oversimplification of a rather extensive academic literature, but the, main three, the three main reasons why companies invest overseas and engage in foreign direct investment are Number one, what we call resource seeking. A company is looking for a country specific resource that is available only in those countries. Uh, in the case of Cuba, we can look at oil exploration, of course, we can look at nickel, we can look at tourism given the beautiful beaches in Baradero and, and throughout the island, a handful of agricultural products, and that's about it in terms of resource seeking. Companies have to go where the resources are. If you're in the copper business, you need to go to Chile. You cannot open that business in South Beach. So that's one motivation. The second motivation is efficiency seeking. Companies look to invest abroad to gain some sort of efficiencies, typically lower la labor costs <laughs> or a privileged distribution location. Uh, in the case of Cuba, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, I don't think we're going to see a lot of efficiency seeking for indirect investment going into the island. And the third reason why companies invest overseas is market seeking. That is to say, looking to establish a manufacturing operation, let's say, in a given country to serve the needs of that particular market. So resource seeking, efficiency seeking, market seeking are the three fundamental motivations why companies choose to <coughs> invest overseas. <coughs> Let us briefly explore these three in, in the case of Cuba. 
Cuba will indeed be able to attract some resource-seeking foreign direct investment. It has done so under the Castros, under extremely difficult conditions for foreign investors. But again, it will be limited to those areas where Cuba has some resources and companies do not have a choice to go elsewhere if they do want those resources. In terms of efficiency seeking, I will submit to you that Cuba's labor cost will not be an attractive proposition for foreign companies. Uh, companies can indeed go to a lot of other locations in the planet, India, Mexico, the People's Republic, to find lower labor costs that they will find in Cuba. Moreover, and this pains me to, to make the point as, as a Cuban-American, but the fact is that after 50 years of living in a totalitarian regime and in a uh, centrally planned command economy, the Cuban labor force has not developed the kind of efficiencies that one would want to see and has developed a quasi-ethic that justifies everything. And it's not an ideal labor, labor force. It doesn't have the kind of discipline. So I don't think an argument can be made that companies will invest in Cuba looking for efficiency-seeking lower labor costs or certainly a privileged uh, distribution location uh, as one may find in a, in a central European country where one can distribute to the rest of the continent. Cuba is an island with not ideal uh, port facilities and efficiency. And market seeking, well, it is not an insignificant market. It's a marketer of 11 plus million people, but it is an impoverished market. The disposable income of the Cuban population is close to nothing. So I suspect that there's not going to be a great deal of market uh, seeking foreign direct investment. If you're in the business of selling television sets to Cubans, you are going to prefer to manufacture them in the maquiladoras in Mexico and export them to Cuba. You're not going to set up a plant in Havana to serve that, that market. Now, given this rather pessimistic view of foreign direct investment, uh, I offer in, in my book, Mañana in Cuba, and I'm plugging the book only because I am donating all the proceeds to the University of Miami. Uh, but I, I offer in my book some approaches that a future Cuban government and a United States government can utilize that could promote American foreign direct investment in a post-Castro milieu. And, and these approaches are specifically rooted on the theoretical underpinnings of why companies invest overseas. That is to say, on international business theory, international business principles, rather than very broad generalizations of international economics. The first point I want to make on that is that the role of the Cuban-American community in that environment the Cuban-American community will not be guided by the strict economic rationality that I have just outlined. The Cuban-American community will be guided by family reasons, by a lot of emotional reasons. So it will not be guided by that sort of a strict economic rationality. Moreover, this is a community that can more easily overcome the innate disadvantages of being a foreigner uh, in trying to succeed in a foreign environment. Following the FDI, the foreign direct investment literature, the Cuban American community can be expected to play the role of what we call first movers in foreign direct investment. And this is extremely important. The role of first movers is extremely important because we know that in any given industry, companies invest to gain competitive advantage. They are very, very sensitive to the competitive moves or of other firms in a given industry. In fact, we do know from the FDI literature that there is a follow the leader behavior 
in foreign direct investment. And parenthetically, uh, when we look at the, uh, the studies that have been made on foreign direct investment, we normally find that the first mover is not the dominant <coughs> firm in a given industry. It tends to be a second tier company, perhaps because they're looking to gain a competitive advantage. So there is indeed a follow the leader uh, behavior and is typically not led by the dominant firm in a given industry. In terms of the Cuban American community, I think we can discern two general categories. Number one, um, the small and medium sized Cuban American uh, entrepreneur that has a pharmacy in Hialeah and is going to set up a pharmacy in Marianao and he's gonna have his cousin run the pharmacy and he's gonna go back and forth and so on and so forth. There is gonna be an element, of course, of that Cuban-American entrepreneur. But an often neglected part of this equation is Cuban-American middle and senior executives in the multinational world. There are, and I, and I talk to a number of these people on a daily basis, there are significant numbers of middle managers and senior managers in corporate America that would act as champions for a foreign direct investment of that organization into Cuba. They would be the ones that could carry the flag. Historically, we can of course think of uh, Coca-Cola, Kellogg's with Carlos Gutierrez and so on and so forth. And there are of course any number of Cuban Americans as CEOs and CFOs of very <coughs> important companies that, that uh, can be active. <coughs> A future Cuban government would be well advised to try to design policies to attract foreign direct investment that are rooted in the thinking that goes on in corporate boardrooms. That is to say, design policies that address <coughs> the panorama of issues that are weighted by corporate strategists and decision makers. To give you an example, the kind of policy that I'm talking about is one that would seek to foster what I have labeled a competitive urgency to invest. And you can foster a competitive urgency to invest by offering first movers a sustainable competitive advantage. Companies are much more likely to invest if by doing so they can gain a sustainable competitive advantage over other companies <coughs> in their industry. And I'll give you just one example. I mean, until we're running out of time. Um, a package of benefits could be set up by, on either side of uh, the forest straits to incite companies to invest. Could be tax incentives, a privileged location, what have you. That would be offered if companies invest by a sunset date. If you invest uh, within two years, you will have access to all of these <coughs> benefits for the next five years. So by setting up a sunset date, companies are now uh, motivated to invest. And if you do have a first mover that goes into, the, into that environment, the other companies will feel somewhat compelled to follow. A and finally, it has become somewhat politically incorrect uh, to argue, uh, as I have just done, or to emphasize a role for the Cuban American community in a post-Castro Cuba, post-Castro economic milieu. But I would submit to you that a future Cuban government, if it is at all interested in promoting and attracting foreign direct investment, would be well advised to look as the, at the Cuban American community as first movers as those that can help to the island overcome those conditions that would otherwise are going to limit investment going into Cuba 
to that of the resource seeking kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, we now move, please, to Mr. Reich. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for doing this. I'm happy to be here. I should say our real Cuban expert is Jake Colvin, uh, our uh, Vice President for Global Trade Issues, and who, who is in Geneva right now working on global trade issues. So you have me instead, and I'm not as well versed in the field, but I'll do my best. Uh, I want to begin <coughs> with just a word about the National Foreign Trade Council and USA Engage, so you know who we are. The National Foreign uh, Trade Council, which has been around for um, 96 years, uh, essentially is the organization that speaks for global companies. Our members are large multinational companies, the companies that really created the global supply chain concept, and the work we do is largely in support of, of um, them and their objectives. USA Engage is a subsidiary of the NFTC, and it is the organization that opposes unilateral economic sanctions. And I emphasize the word unilateral. And I want to be clear that we oppose sanctions, uh, unilateral sanctions, as a matter of principle. Uh, we think they don't work. Uh, we think they, in the process of not working, they f fail to achieve America's foreign policy objectives, and uh, they hurt Americans at the same time, which we think is sort of a lose-lose proposition. That is not an implication that we support the governments against whom we oppose the sanctions. We don't support the Cuban government. We don't support the Iranian government, which is where I'm spending most of my time right now working on Iran sanctions. We didn't support the Libyan government. But uh, the name of the organization is USA Engage because we think engagement and diplomacy is a better tool for achieving America's objectives, whether they're economic or political or foreign policy, than unilateral sanctions. So that's where we come from, and therefore I'm here really as an advocate uh, uh, in support of eliminating the embargo and other restri restrictions on relations with, uh, with, with Cuba. Uh, that said, I have to say I agree with a lot of the things the two preceding uh, panelists have said, uh, and which I think will become evident as I go forward. I think I may come out in a different place in the bottom line, but I think a lot of what they said uh, makes sense. And uh, what, uh, what Chris said in the beginning about uh, the tendency to view this as much more of a black and white issue than a gray issue is a point well taken. I, I mean, there are people that assume that the embargo goes away and then Castro will go away and everything's going to be fine. And then there's the other side, of course, that assumes that the slightest change will mean uh, you know, an enormous mistake. The reality is a lot more complex, and I think uh, both of the preceding panelists have said a lot about that, much of which I agree with. I think I want to make <clears throat> essentially four points, the first of which um, is that in thinking about this issue, there are fewer statutory obstacles to changing our policy than most people think. Uh, it is, I think, a common view that as a result of Helms-Burton, Helms uh, the President really has very little flexibility in this area. Uh, in fact, while Hel Helms Burton codified the embargo, uh, it also codified the President's licensing, licensing authority and therefore his authority to make changes to the embargo. That was evidenced most clearly last year, as, as Chris pointed out, by the, uh, the telecommunications uh, change as well as the uh, direct banking relationship issue that was uh, instituted. Now, whether that was a good idea or not, whether it worked or not, I think my first point is it illustrates, the, in many respects, the flexibility the President has to act on his own initiative through the regulatory process uh, in order to produce a fairly significant change in, in the reach and the scope of the embargo. The fact that he's chosen not to do that, or in, and certainly that his predecessor chose to tighten the screws rather than loosen them, it, you know, that's a policy question. But the tools are there. The one place that the tools are probably not there, arguably, and that is uh, in travel, the right of Americans to travel to Cuba, because the Trade Sanctions Reform Act provided a statutory limitation on that. So to make significant changes in travel, the, con the President would have to go back to the Congress, which is one reason why you've seen a proliferation of travel bills and travel amendments uh, over the years. Uh, the second point is that, from our point of view, the, the real obstacles to forward progress, which for us would be uh, opening up the relationship, is the broken nature of the bilateral relationship. And uh, 
in essence, Florida and to a lesser degree New Jersey politics, which has been the critical element of, of I think, Cuba policy in the United States for the last 40 years. It really is a function of Florida politics. Florida has the, I guess in this context, the advantage of being a, a highly competitive state uh, and a, as a large state, a critical one in national elections and one that therefore that is uh, hard, uh, hotly fought over and hotly contested. And every group, uh, and Florida has lots of them, is important. And that, I think, has made this issue a more significant one than, for example, if all the Cuban Americans lived in Utah, uh, the politics of this would probably be a lot different. Um, I'm not recommending that they all move, but that's, you know. <laughs> in any event, <laughs> Um, it seems clear, and I think uh, the first speaker alluded to that, that this administration's approach has not been, uh, has not been one of change, uh, or not been one of sweeping change anyway. I, I think it's been best described as baby steps. And uh, there has been a few, uh, some of which occurred last year, uh, changes in, in uh, modest changes in allowing Cuban Americans to travel and in, in sending remittance, remittan remittances remittances. I'll get it right. Uh, and, uh, you know, some other relatively small things. Their policy seems to be uh, tempered with the, the idea that an American action would be uh, followed by essentially a, an equal Cuban action, a reciprocation, and that the relationship could then improve bilaterally as we kind of ratchet up the relationship. We do something, they do something back and forth. Uh, we've tried this with the Iranians uh, in the 90s. Actually, we tried it with the Iranians in the late 80s and then in the 90s. It didn't work very well. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be working uh, here either as, as a policy in the sense that you don't see a lot of reciprocation out of the Cubans. Um, I think from our point of view, there's a simple reason for that, and that is the Cuban government is really the biggest beneficiary of the embargo. Uh, it allows them to blame their problems on us and it allows them to make uh, the United States the, the bad guy in their equation. And uh, we've noticed, as I think have, have you, that not only do they not seem interested in encouraging a rapid change in the relationship, they've taken active steps in the past years to actually sabotage improvements when it appeared that past presidents were going to take a, uh, a significant uh, step. Uh, you know, I've put it in more uh, uh, cruder terms when in, in the Clinton administration. I served in the Clinton administration. I uh, ran the BIS, the Export Control Program that, that was alluded to earlier. Um, it seemed to us that every time Clinton wanted to make a, a step toward opening up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Cuban relationship, Castro would shoot somebody or put somebody in jail. Um, and I think it's not an accident that that happened. Uh, it's the government there that has the most to lose, uh, which suggests a lot of ironies in our policy. Now, <clears throat> the administration, in uh, taking baby steps, has hinted that it's going to look to Congress to take more dramatic action. Uh, lifting the travel ban is a logical place if you were looking for drama, and it's where a lot of efforts have been focused. I think as we've been learning, well, we didn't learn it because we already knew it, but as, I, as we are seeing over and over again, asking Congress to change Cuba policy is a heavy lift uh, for a lot of reasons, <clears throat> in part because members who strongly support the status quo have been very effective over the years in convincing their colleagues, particularly incoming new members of Congress, to side with them on an issue that uh, a lot of them have never thought about uh, deeply. And so you have one of these interesting cases in Congress, and this is, this is not unique by any means, where you've got a relatively small number of people who care intensely about it, this issue, for whom it's probably the single most important issue on their plate, and they spend an awful lot of time uh, communicating their views to people who come from other parts of the country who really couldn't care less about this issue. Uh, they have uh, <clears throat> very few Cubans, uh, very few Cuban Americans. They're far away, and they may have much, very perceive themselves as having little to gain statewide uh, from a, a, a change in the embargo uh, status. So. They're sort of up for grabs, and uh, the f community of members of Congress who feel very strongly in support of the status quo have been very adept and skillful and, and successful over the years at co-opting uh, 
a lot of members into their point of view on the strength of uh, arguments and, and I assume uh, log rolling. That's what one does when one is in Congress and uh, if they're any good, that's what they're doing. So it's, it's hard to uh, anticipate major change under the circumstances. And that's just the House. Uh, the Senate, as we know for many reasons, uh, it's even harder to get anything accomplished. Mm -hmm. I spent 17 years in the Senate. Uh, that was in the good old days when occasionally you could accomplish something. Uh, it's gotten more difficult. <laughs> Last year, you know, there's a bright sign or two. Last year the Congress included changes to two, Cuba policy in two separate bills, one at the beginning of the year and another in the omnibus appropriation at the end. Those were minor changes. Uh, one uh, clarified business travel and, and defunded the uh, the, the travel ban, uh, and at the end they clarified the cash in advance uh, payment issue, which is something that the Bush administration had, uh, I'm trying to put it charitably, had, had distorted out of all economic logic, uh, and so they've returned it to a normal commercial definition, uh, still requiring cash, but uh, at, actually requiring cash in a context in which you could actually uh, receive the payment. Uh, nevertheless, the, the modesty of those uh, statements aside, we thought they were, those policy changes, we thought they were significant because they actually got through the Senate and became law. They were carried over from the House. They were not stripped out in the Senate. They were not stripped out in Congress, conference, which is what has usually happened for the previous eight, ten years. Uh, there was opposition, but in the end they went through. This is actually a fun fundamental change compared to the previous eight years. And we think this is a sign that, that there is a little bit more uh, ferment and I think a little bit more uh, flexibility on this issue in the Congress than has been demonstrated heretofore. That does not mean that, you know, next week, uh, you know, Congressman Peterson's bill is going to pass, but it does suggest that more and more people are beginning to think about this. Uh, we think um, uh, this is one of these cases where we've got the merits and the other side's got the politics, but we think that that is uh, changing, at least as far as the politics are concerned, not as far as the merits are concerned. Uh, we would like to see a bill like the one that Chairman Peterson has drafted the floor, which would end the travel ban, establish direct banking relationships to improve ag salaries, and fix the cash in advance, further fix the cash in advance rule. The third point is, I think, as uh, Professor Azell has stated, it's important to examine the total economic relationship uh, with clarity and objectivity. Uh, there are a bunch of companies that are already allowed to do business under TISRA. I think you got the uh, you got some of the statistics from our, our moderator. Uh, AgMed uh, uh, pr uh, products of, of many different kinds and surprising variety. If you just think about agriculture and 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 medicine, uh, a surprising diversity are already allowed to go. Um, some companies are already exporting on a cash basis to Cuba. If policy shift, there would be more of those exports. I mean, there are economic gains out there. I don't think there are as, much, as many as, as some have forecast. There would certainly, I think, be a spike in U.S. travel, at least in the short run. A lot of people wanting to go see what it was like. Uh, that, no doubt, would level off, and then we would see what the net increase would be. And, of course, there would be some demand for the classic Cuban products that we all read about, rum and cigars in particular. Um, we could spend a, probably a whole panel talking about sugar and American sugar policy and the implications for a change in the Cuban embargo, but I won't bore you with that. Uh, however, one, if you start down that road and start removing sanctions, then you begin to see exactly the, uh, the, the points that my colleague was, was making, which is the other limiting factor from the economic relationship, which is with the Cuban, the Cuban economy and the Cuban government. Cuba is limited in what it can buy from the United States and other countries. The rate of return by tourists to Cuba is fairly low compared to other Caribbean destinations. The infrastructure isn't there. The restaurants, the, you know, things like that simply aren't there to the same degree. And while Cuban government officials suggest that they would be open to foreign investment by the United States, turning off the sanctions is not going to turn into a, you know, a, a waterfall of, of foreign investment there. It's a relatively inhospitable investment climate in Cuba. You can't own land. Uh, there's a layer of political bureaucracy that complicates investment. Uh, Cubans express interest in certain narrow exceptions, as, as you've described. I, but I don't see a, a, a landslide of Americans going there. Uh, but let me make a couple of footnotes to that. First of all, I should tell you from the standpoint of my members, there's a good bit of interest in going there. That doesn't necessarily translate into anybody doing anything. Right now they can't, but we get, have uh, more consultations than you might think with major companies who want to talk to us about prospects for doing business in Cuba 
and what the current obstacles are, uh, and we you know give them the information they need, then they go away. But uh, I think that uh, were the rules to change, uh, you would see a lot more initial uh, you know scurrying around and looking than one might think. There is clearly, uh, I would call it a lemming effect in the business community. Uh, some of the things that Professor Azell said really are based on the assumption that business makes rational decisions. Uh, my experience is that that's not always true. Uh, there's a lemming effect in this business. One goes, they all go, uh, whether it makes any economic sense or not to do that. Uh, you saw that in China over the last 15 years. You're about to see it in India. Um, Cuba is a much smaller scale, but you'll see the same thing. A bunch of them will go. It'll make absolutely no sense. Uh, but they'll go anyway. Uh, for some of them, it would make sense uh, because if you look at the matter sectorally, uh, first entrance, uh, first entry makes a difference in some cases. In the telecommunications sector, in particular, getting in first, establishing yourself, uh, makes an enormous difference. If you're in, the, if you're selling soap, it's completely different. You know, there already is soap in Cuba. Uh, people, other people sell soap. If you want to plan your strategy fairly carefully, if you want to set up cell phone networks. There's a real advantage to being early, and that means uh, taking risks, being prepared to lose a lot of money. So people will go in, even though uh, in the face of all the conditions that both of us have just uh, acknowledged. But the fact remains, it's an old-school state-run economy, which is weighed down by inefficient state-run industries and a dual currency system that uh, disadvantages uh, Cuban citizens and makes doing business uh, with Cuba very difficult. So uh, we don't look for miracles. Uh, we think, actually, the, the right reason for getting rid of the embargo is it's the best reason, it's the right way to produce change in the Cuban government and to produce, ultimately, the kind of government that would be open and uh, would uh, and a government that would not commit the human rights abuses that it's committing and would free up its economy so that people can grow, have better jobs, and make more money. So our view at the end of the day is that a more prosperous bilateral relationship will requires an end to, end to sanctions, but it also requires incentives for entrepreneurs, innovators, and workers in Cuba. We're doing our part on the sanctions part, but the Cuban government, at the end of the day, has to work on the other part. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We now go to our last uh, presentation on the panel. Jorge, just a clicker for your... Um, you, you can see that I'm the corporate guy. I have to have a PowerPoint presentation, otherwise I get in trouble. <laughs> or a military guy. Or a military guy. <laughs> um, Again, thank you to the uh, Wilson Center for, for inviting us to, to, to this important event. Um, the, the, the good thing about it and the bad thing of being the last guy on the panel is that I have tons of comments and answers for the three guys that <laughs> went before me. Uh, but I, I am going to focus, and I am going to focus on energy, uh, and I'm sure I'll come back and, and, and um, um, have some comments on what my fellow panelists have said. Um, let, let me, before we start, there are two important theories or thoughts that I need to put in your minds as we go through my presentation. One is what we call the, the, the theory of energy intensity. And any, any economy in the world understands that uh, the link between energy and GDP, in other words, the amount of energy needed uh, to produce one dollar of output. Uh, for example, if you look at the energy uh, intensity theory and you apply it to China, China today uses 1.5 units of energy to produce one dollar of output. The, the high cost, by the way, there is a social cost in the China example, because of course China is using coal. So there is a huge environmental and health cost uh, that is also uh, impacts China. So the theory of energy intensity vis-a-vis -vis Cuba is important because it is one of the main issues and obstacles in transitional economics or transitional economies. Uh, transitional economies, those that are the economies that are going, of course, from a centralized uh, economic system to a quasi-free market system. Uh, so again, uh, we have to be very careful. And, and the beauty of Cuba, of course, is that we're beginning with a clean slate. Uh, so when we apply the theory of um, energy intensity in Cuba, it's, 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 it's fun uh, to look at and develop uh, because you're beginning from, from a clean slate. The second thing that I want you to keep in mind through my presentation is that in the energy field, the developmental timeline for any one of our projects in our industry is anywhere between three to seven years. That's very important because some of the issues that I'm going to bring up are also political. 
So remember, if you begin the process or some sort of a process in developing a project in the energy sector in Cuba today, it will take anywhere between three to seven years for you to complete that project, depending on the sector of the economy. So two main things to keep in mind, uh, the theory of energy intensity, and again, the timeline that our projects uh, take to, to take place. Uh, when I was asked to join the panel, uh, the Discovery Horizon uh, incident in the Gulf of Mexico had not taken place. Uh, so I'm also going to address now uh, the, the issue of uh, the Discovery Horizon and, and how could that impact uh, the energy sector. Most of you know that, again, by the bio, uh, that even though I am today with FIU, I, I have a 32-year experience uh, in the oil business, uh, lived uh, as an expat overseas for about 15 years of my career. Um, so uh, that's the background that I'm going to share with you vis-a-vis -vis Cuba. And I don't know, oh, this is a pointer. Um, can you hit the, awesome. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let me give you a brief timeline um, of, of history of, 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 of energy in Cuba because I, th I, I think it's in the first 50 years there was very little crude oil production, if any. Uh, the, the oil companies in Cuba at that time were the Shells and the Exxons and the Texacos, and those were involved in refining. The three Cuban refineries at that time were owned by Shell, by Exxon, and Texaco. Uh, the crude oil that Cuba refined at that time was either Mexican crude or Venezuelan crude, uh, Mexican crude prior to 1934, of course, um, that uh, the equity owners of those refineries were bringing in. You had other companies like Sinclair, who was also in marketing, and then, of course, you had my former company, Amaco, Standard Oil of Indiana, uh, and Gulf, Standard Oil of Pennsylvania, and a few others that were involved in exploration and production activities in Cuba with very little results, if any. So that's the, the period before 19, 1959, 1960. What happens in the energy sector in Cuba during the, the period of the Soviet Union is extremely important for a number of factors. Uh, number one, the sugar for oil barter exchange between Cuba and, and, and the former Soviet Union. What, what happened there is that was the first example of Cuba's dependency, true economic dependency on, on oil. In other words, Cuba at that time was getting as, as much as 250,000 barrels a day. Most of it, by the way, it never came to Cuba. Uh, it was Euro's type of crude oil. Uh, a, a, a crude that was at that time in Western Europe was Western Europe was well liked, uh, so a lot of that oil never reached Cuba, but it was sold basically for cash um, in in Europe. But what happened also to the Cuban economy uh, and really to Cuba society is that they learned to spl splurge. I mean, there was oil everywhere. So. Uh, from Che Guevara's industrial ideas of building all kind of strange energy, uh, you know, high energy consumption industries to, to whatever. So that period, to me, was extremely bad precedent and actually was part of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the vacuum uh, that was created in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, of course, another important thing happened in 1971, and that was the discovery of the Varadero field. Uh, the discovery of the Varadero field, heavy oil, um, which again I'll go into in a minute today, basically covers about one third of Cuba's oil production. But the discovery of the Varadero field was really, by, by Russian geologists, uh, was really the beginning of the Cuban domestic uh, upstream uh, oil industry. So the other important project in that period was the building of the Sinfuegos refinery. That was about a 65,000 barrels a day refinery. Um, that never got off the ground because basically it, it, they finished building it right in 1991 and it never got off the ground. Uh, the Cubans surprisingly did a very good job in mothballing that unit, and as we all know, uh, that unit now is back on stream. What's important in the period that, I, that, I want, that I'm going to talk about now, there are three main factors. One, uh, in 1993, uh, Cuba opens its oil sector to foreign companies. Um, and Cuba's PSA, production sharing agreement, by the way, is extremely commercial. There is no oil industry in the world that I know of that have looked at Cuba's PSA that would not sign in the dotted line. Again, assuming that the fine print is, is acceptable. Uh, but Cuba did a very good job, Coupet did a very good job going overseas, talking to a bunch of different countries. 
and coming up with what we think from the industry point of view, it is a balanced PSA. Um, also in 2000, 2002, they open up the deep water area, uh, that which of course is within Cuba's uh, economics exclusive zone in deep water, and I'll go over that. But then come the main message that I want to send in my, in my talk is that the same scenario that they had with the Soviet Union now is being repeated with Venezuela. And the Cubans are well aware of that, by the way. Let me guarantee you, and let me assure you, that the Cubans are very well, very well aware of that. Uh, and I'll go into the numbers of the risks that we have here. Um, and then, of course, now Cuba is in the middle of a refinery expansion program with Venezuela. And, that's, and, and it seems that, that Mr. Chavez, as far as Cuba is concerned, does have the checkbook. He is signing the checkbook. Uh, and I can tell you that at least two of their major projects, uh, a project in Santiago de Cuba, a project in Matanzas, uh, the pipeline and the expansion of uh, Cienfuegos, uh, first stage to about 110,000 barrels a day, is going forward. I, I can personally assure you uh, that those projects are moving forward. So at least... Uh, the, the checkbook from the Venezuelans vis-a-vis -vis their oil projects in Cuba is still there. Um, Cuba today consumes about 160,000 barrels a day. 60% um, uh, of that is fuel oil, again, emphasizing the power sector, the nickel sector, uh, cement industries. In other words, uh, industries in which in most countries today, at least certainly we in the U.S., uh, we would use uh, natural gas for a lot of these projects. Uh, the other bad thing here is that this is high sulfur material. This is 3%. Uh, we don't burn 3% anywhere today. 3% uh, sulfur sometime material is burned in, in bunkers for ships. Uh, but in the U.S., most facilities is 1% or 7 tenths sulfur content. Um, so again, of, of the 160, 60% 60 of that is fuel oil. About 23% uh, is diesel basically commercial transportation, and then opposite to what we have here in the U.S. and in developed societies, of course, very little consumption of jet fuel, of gasoline, and of uh, LPG. Uh, crude production today in that north coast of Cuba's trip from Baradero to La Habana is about 52,000 barrels a day, uh, which means then that about 93 to about 100,000 barrels a day come from Venezuela. Uh, about 60% of that is crude oil that Cuba refines in, in its refineries, and the balance is, ref is, is products, is petroleum products that they import. Uh, and I'll go into, again, into detail. One of the good stories in, in Cuba is that uh, all of their natural gas production is associated natural gas. These are not natural gas fields. This is natural gas that's inherently in the, in the crude oil reservoirs. Uh, for many years, they used to flare that. For those of you that have been there, when you travel in the old days from Baradero to, to La Habana, it smelled like rotten eggs, you know, throughout that, and you, and you saw the flares. That's already gone uh, because energy gas has come in, and in fact, about 17 to 20 percent of Cuba's electric power today is generated uh, by this associated natural gas. So it's a very good story, also a very commercial uh, business story uh, that Sherrod has had with, with this project. Um, interesting, before I go, uh, I have worked with uh, the James Baker Institute at Rice University, and there's a couple of projects that you will see here coming out in the next few months. And I can preempt it and, and, and share with you that the study that we have done at Rice University is that under a free market economy, under a free market economy, even, even with, with Jose's uh, uh, pessimistic outlook of, of Cuba's economy, uh, we think that Cuba's demand could be as high as 300,000 barrels a day. Also, in the power sector today, Cuba's power production capacity is about 3,000 megawatts. We think that that could go as high as 7,000 megawatts. So we see a huge increase uh, uh, in, in, in Cuba's, on the different scenarios, uh, of, of Cuba's oil demand in the future. That's also important for you to keep in mind. Now, let's go to Venezuela for a minute. This is, this is very important because this is the black box that a lot of people talk about. Um, let me share with you that the data here is data that I have validated with, with a number of sources. Uh, this data is not available, uh, but I feel extremely comfortable uh, that plus or minus 10%, uh, it's, it's good data. In my industry, we're not concerned with uh, decimal points. There was, there was a boss of mine who always used to say 
magnitude and trend, magnitude and trend. He just wanted to know what the magnitude of the issue was and what was the trend line of the issue. So this will give you an idea of, of, of the magnitude. We have taken the last four or five years we, because of the uh, oil strike in Venezuela in 2003. Even though Cuba is a signator of Petrocaribe, the Cuban agreement with Venezuela is not Petrocaribe. The Cuban agreement with Venezuela is a contract that was signed in October of 2000, which is El Convenio de, de, de Integra, Integración Económica. And also another one in October of 2000, early on, which is El Acuerdo de Caracas. And what El, el, el Acuerdo de Integración Comercial, or El Convenio de Integración Comercial, gives the Cubans is that when you read it, it's a barter agreement by which Cuba gets oil, and the Cubans in return can give the Venezuelans anything. <laughs> anything point of view, I think there's about 12 different sections in the, in the agreement, but mainly is a lot of consulting services. So when somebody says, well, what is the value of a doctor? By the way, the doctors and the teachers and the sport trainers and everybody's also listening. You can say, well, fine, a sports trainer has a value of X. Uh, and, and I can assure you that there are, what, 32,000, 31,000 uh, Cuban professionals in Venezuela today? Uh, that certainly doesn't amount to these numbers. But there's a lot of things in that agreement that eventually, at the end of the day, I can justify uh, the amount of the value of crude oil. Now, what you have in the first column is the value of the crude oil received by Cuba from Venezuela in in including what our estimate is for this year. And in billions? That is billions, I'm sorry, this, that those are billions of dollars. Those are billions of dollars. So, and, and that is the market value of the oil. So in other words, if Venezuela disappears tomorrow, I'm sorry, if the, if the relationship between Cuba and Venezuela disappears tomorrow, this is the cash flow impact just in oil that Venezuela will have in Cuba. Please take that, write it down somewhere when you do your, your 25 years at 1% interest. So the column in the left is the column that supposedly Cuba has paid or that Cuba is responsible for paying within 90 days. The column on the right is the amount that Cuba supposedly has now as a long-term debt with Venezuela. Now, every year, there's a Comisión Mixta Cuba-Venezuela that meets, and the Comisión Mixta is the one that took, takes a look at the convenio. And they're the ones that balance all the projects that they have going on with the amount of oil that has been delivered. It is a very difficult group to get into and to get the data and get the numbers. But what we have been able to get is that in their credit column, they so far have eight point, almost nine billion dollars that they're saying that Cuba has provided them with services, which happens to be pretty close to the seven or eight billion of the short-term debt. So our understanding then is, based on the people that we have spoken with and based on all the data and numbers that we can gather, is that the exchange, the barter exchange, is an amount equal to the short-term debt but that the long-term debt by Cuba to Venezuela will still be outstanding. But the main key to this graphic, the key to this graphic is that you have to understand the vacuum that will be created or the power that a Venezuelan government will have in a future transitional government of Cuba. If somebody doesn't address the issue of how is the Cuban economy going to support $3 billion worth of negative cash flow. In other words, if people think that the Periodo Especial was bad back in 1991, let me tell you, this is going to be tremendous. Therefore, why do we have people like Ramiro Valdez in Caracas and so on? Because they understand that there's no plan B. There's no insurance policy. That's important. Um, now. Let me, let me go into, into um, and I got another five minutes. Let, let, let me go into the, uh, the Discovery Horizon. This is the um, 
Sancedo número 9, which is a, a, gener a six generation semi submersible rig, state of the art, uh, being completed. She's almost finished. In fact, she went, uh, if you can pass to the next one uh, slide, uh, she just was lowered into the bay and she is now going through some uh, seaworthy exercises. Um, this unit uh, is owned by INI, uh, the Italian oil company. Uh, this unit is reported to be 100% non-U.S. components. As you know, one of the problems that foreign oil companies working in Cuba have had is that any rig going to Cuba cannot have more than 10% of U.S. components. This rig, they have gone through it with a fine-tooth comb. Trust me, not even the metal used in the screws or whatever comes from the U.S. Uh, it is reported that um, it is going to Cuba and it will be in Cuban waters sometime in after September. Um, the going rate, just to show you how expensive this project is for this rig, is $472,000 a day. Uh, this rig can drill at depths of 10,000 feet. Um, he has, he can, can accommodate about 200 people. Uh, again, uh, uh, it's been built in China, uh, and it hasn't been confirmed, but everything that we see, uh, it seems to indicate to us that they, this rig is moving into Cuban waters uh, sometime after September. Uh, supposedly, Repsol will pick it up, uh, and as long, as soon as Repsol finishes with it, uh, the other companies in there, like Petrobras and also uh, uh, Petronas from Malaysia and ONG and others, uh, will back back to back the contract. So this rig, if it, if it goes to Cuba, it will be op operating in Cuba's EEC for quite a while. Um, the the Cuban EEC goes all the way to the Eastern Gap. The Eastern Gap, as you know, is one of the two donut holes, the famous donut holes in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. The Western Gap belongs to Mexico and the U.S. The Eastern Gap is split three ways between Cuba, uh, the U.S., and Mexico. Uh, this is um, the North uh, Cuba Basin. This is the area, this is not all of the EEC, but this is the area that the, the USGS says that there is about between five and six billion barrels of oil and about eight trillion cubic feet of, of gas. Uh, and uh, usually the data coming from the USGS is pretty reliable. By the way, that number is a P50 scenario. In, in the oil industry, as you know, it's undiscovered oil, so we run different scenarios. The P90 or the P9 scenario is like nine billion barrels. So this number that I'm giving you is only the P50 scenario. So this is where the rig is going to be working, uh, that area. Uh, and you can see then, after the discovered horizon, how important it is for the U.S. and Cuba to establish some sort of a bridge with the oil industry in the states of Texas and Louisiana, not for them to go to Cuba and discover oil, but imagine, imagine what would have happened if the Discovery Horizon incident would have happened in Cuban waters. We could have nothing. I mean, basically, no, no mini submarine, the boom, all of the equipment that's available in the U.S. Gulf Coast would have been sitting in Houston or in Corpus Christi or in Mobile or in New Orleans or in Freeport because the machinery of the, of the, the, the bureaucracy would not have been able to move to get that equipment. Uh, and even having that equipment, you can see the problems that BP is having today. So, uh, so certainly, if you go back to my earlier comment, that it takes anywhere between three to seven years, that's why I personally believe uh, that now is the time uh, for Cuba and the United States to start talking about energy, uh, because it is very important. It's very important for Cuba politically, uh, and it's very important. If you go to the last slide, and I'll finish one more. Uh, I'll skip this one. Go to the next one, please. So um, I, I believe that it's in the best interest of the United States, uh, both, again, from an economic point of view and also from a political point of view, to begin the process of creating a Cuba for the future that is, that is energy independent. Uh, we certainly don't want a Cuba or a future transition government in Cuba to depend on a Venezuela or a Soviet Union or anybody else. Uh, and second one is because we do have a lot of resources, our industry has a lot of resources uh, to work in the modernization of the energy infrastructure, uh, 
Uh, natural gas and LNG, all of our power plants in Cuba ought to be running on natural gas or LNG. Uh, Sugarcane ethanol, that's, that's, that's huge. Uh, energy convers convers uh, conservation and, of course, uh, environmental stewardship. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, we'd like to open the floor now to uh, question and answer period. Uh, I believe there are some microphones making their way through the room. Uh, if you could please uh, identify yourselves and your institution. Uh, we'd like to open the floor now for questions and discussion. No questions? Please. John McAuliffe from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. Um, Chris, in, in your remarks, I wasn't sure what legislation you were talking about that had been defeated. I mean, it was three years ago that the Wrangell Ag Bill went up and down with a lot of specific factors in that that didn't really say much about where we were. As was mentioned later, the, the first serious effort for legislation to end travel restrictions is what is now an ag bill, um, and that hasn't even gone through markup. That will probably happen after Memorial Day recess, and then the vote will probably be in the first, in before the Fourth of July recess. But so, and we don't know. I mean, I would say that a week ago I was very pessimistic, but now because of the Cardinals meeting with Raul Castro and working out some agreement on political prisoners, medical treatment and movement and releases, um, the hint that something might be resolved on the Alan Gross case, I think it's entirely possible that the legislation will pass. Um, regardless of whether that happens, I agree with your premise uh, that the administration has failed, grossly failed, to carry out its own intentions. Um, one thing on, on telecommunications that you may not be aware of is that it can't really function unless the phony status of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism is eliminated, because only once that's eliminated can Cuban receipts from any kind of telecommunications agreement be protected from uh, lawsuits. So, so that's a, an important other step that has to happen in addition to the bureaucratic things that you pointed out. But uh, I mean, I would, I think that uh, to disagree, uh, to, to, to follow up a little bit on what Bill said, if the administration clearly could tomorrow do what it had intended to do last April, more than a year ago when it announced Cuban-American travel, it could do unrestricted travel for educational, cultural, religious, humanitarian, support for the Cuban people purposes. And, and the real puzzle, other than the, the usual Florida, New Jersey politics argument is why, uh, you know, whether it's the misappointment of Dan Restrepo as the person responsible for Cuba policy or what's responsible for it, I don't know. But I think that's, uh, re if Congress does it, then it's done. If Congress doesn't do it, then the administration really still has a major opportunity and responsibility. Uh, John, I'll, I'm always amazed and, and appreciate your optimism. Um, uh, when it comes to the U.S. Uh, Congress changing the travel bill, I'm willing to bet publicly right now it ain't going nowhere. Um, I've spoken to the sponsors. Uh, they have no hopes for it. They've abandoned it. Um, certainly Luger, his staff, um, McDonald, they have, they have other fights to pick. It's election year. It, it's going nowhere. That's not, uh, I'm not saying that's the desired outcome, but uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and I'll be honest, a few political prisoners here, some changes with the Catholic Church is not going to change the votes that are lined up, and they've been lined up with hard cash donations to Congress people to affect that vote. It's not going anywhere. Um, I, I, you know, and I, to be honest, I think it's a red herring to focus on it too much for precisely the reasons you say. And again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, we fought this fight on the embargo. People are losing it um, for reasons that are just basic. Look, look who the, the Cuba, the pro-embargo Cuba PAC who it donates to. 
Um, it's got a well-oiled machine, um, and it donates, you know, for basically forty thousand dollars for the reasons that you had said too. It, it can buy the votes of a lot of congressmen on Cuba because their constituencies really don't constituencies really don't care. This isn't going to be changed by the Cuban government talking to the Catholic Church or the release of a few political prisoners. There's, there's a far colder, uglier, cynical uh, base of politics that's at work here. Um, on your other issue about um, you know, the U.S. moving on, and it, it, well, let me just follow up with that point. And again, it's it the point where it's a huge red herring because you're right. We can change these things with an executive order. We're not even back to Cuba policy pre-Bush. Um, sad. True, when Clinton opened up uh, uh, cultural and educational exchanges, we're not there yet, and it could be done. Um, the, uh, by all accounts, OFAC is much more flexible in its interpretation of travel requests now um, in ways that it wasn't under Bush, but as an official policy, which is really what sort of matters, it isn't there. I hear something's in the works, um, but again, uh, the uh, divergence between rhetoric and action on this case has been uh, quite stark. Well, I, I, I just like to sort of comment that I, I think we're doing a disservice, an intellectual disservice uh, to this debate, and, and I really don't uh, particularly want to get into, into the debate. If we position this in terms purely of uh, the Cuban lobby or the Florida and New Jersey scenarios and things like that, there are strong intellectual arguments for a policy of calibrated engagement, which was indeed the policy during the Clinton administration, as opposed to a policy mm -hmm. of unilateral, unconditional type of concessions to, to, this, to this regime. Um, I recently finished writing a paper that uh, is still in, in process that I've titled Manual de la Perfecta Transición Cubana, which is a, a word play in, uh, on, on some Latin American works, is Manual of the Perfect Cuban Transition. And, and the fact uh, is that what we have learned from the past 50 years is that with the Castro brothers, for whatever number of reasons, megalomania being one of them, um, this kind of unilateral, unconditional concessions are not going to lead to a change in, in, in that regime. Um, so unfortunately and sadly, we may very well have to wait for a time when there is a new leadership uh, that will be more interested in truly engaging <coughs> and bringing profound democratic and economic reforms in Cuba. If that is the case, then it may very well be in the best interest of the United States and of the Cuban people to have <coughs> some chips to play with, to have some concessions to be able to put on the table when that time comes. If we give up all of our policy tools a priori, uh, I think we, we may very well be giving up the opportunity <coughs> to influence a regime that may still be continuity-minded, but perhaps more malleable going, going down the road. And, and there's also an epistemic duty that we have to have. Epistemologically, we owe our audiences the duty to say, if we believe this is the case, what is our reason, our epistemic duty, how do we say that? And uh, I, I would encourage us to frame the debate not in terms of you know, Florida politics, but in terms of what is the most effective policy going forward given what we may encounter uh, in terms of the Cuban leadership. <coughs> Bill, you wanted to say something? Well, I'm going to leave epistemology behind and sink back into the swamp of Florida politics, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you can afford to do that. You're a professor. Um, I live in a different environment. All I'd I'm say a, is I'm a <laughs> um, I think I, I end up somewhere between the two of you. I'm not a, as flat out pessimistic as, as you are, but uh, and certainly I'm based on less information, so I'm, I'm, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take your bet. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it, 
I focus less on the what's going to happen this year, where you're you're probably right for a host of reasons that you didn't mention. But I think long term, the political trend here is clear. Uh, long term, I, I think the Cuban vote as a percentage of, of the vote in in uh, the in Florida as well as in New Jersey is declining, and there's clearly a generational difference of opinion uh, within the Cuban vote on on embargo related issues. Uh, the older generation has the stronger views, and if, you know, like all of us, they're dying off. Uh, and their children and their grandchildren uh, approach this problem, first of all, I think, with less emotion because they have less personal investment in it and, and some different attitudes, particularly on, on, the, on the travel side because they have a, an, a, you know, an ongoing interest in visiting their relatives. And it isn't political. It isn't, uh, and there isn't any, any message in it. They'd like to see people that they don't get to see very often. <laughs> So I, I think the long-term trend is clear. I, uh, frankly, I, uh, I always thought the main reason Clinton tried to do what he did was because he perceived the politics changing and he wanted to get ahead of the curve. Uh, say what you will about him, he was, a, I think, a brilliant politician and he, uh, he didn't always get away with it because it, uh, the politics wasn't, has never changed in the Congress as, as, as quickly as it's changed everywhere else. But uh, the trend line is clear. You come back here in several years and I think we'd be having a very different discussion than we are having today. Uh, because I think a lot more will happen. Whether it happens this year or not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute. Can I just add one thing quickly? Because uh, I actually agree with Jose in the sense, too, that, you know, this does, having, and again, whatever the fate in the, in the long term of lifting the travel ban may be, in the short term, you know, lifting the travel ban is, is problematic in a number of ways. And I'm, personally, I'm not sure that I think the best way to promote democracy and human rights in Cuba is by sending down a group of uh, spring breakers every year. In fact, it would probably have the opposite effect. They may very well seal their borders to uh, drunken hordes of frat boys and sorority girls going down and, and drinking uh, uh, mojitos on the beach and passing out. Um, so we may actually get the reverse reaction. The, the, the question is, what sorts of travel do we want? And I think um, not having the travel ban, ban lifted actually presents an opportunity to look at what sorts of travel we want. And I would propose several. One is um, high-end travelers culturally, intellectually, um, all sorts of sort of cultural exchanges that can really further this in a way that getting backpackers and, and spring breakers down there isn't going to do it and carnival cruise lines. Um, and the NASCAR offseason down there. The, um, but the other way that you know, we can do this is, is begin to uh, uh, really sort of promote um, more of the trust building and the way within the regime, as you implied, Jose, that, that you know, even at, at the level of union to union or, or uh, human rights, law school to law school, a way to sort of build that capacity in human rights, the understanding and awareness of human rights uh, that I think is far more powerful and if done in a targeted way, um, is the sorts of travel that we want to, uh, rather than just opening up the floodgates. So why is that not taking place? I, don't ask me. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I, 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 partly. I, I, think, I think it's, uh, honestly, though, I think that, it's. That's the easy, that's the easy. I, thing. I'll tell you two reasons. I think it's lack of courage. From? Lack of courage from, from this administration. And, and uh, lack of courage and sort of just lack of attention on it. Um, I, they're, they're kind of similar, but I just think it's, it's, I think it's both of those. I just, I just have to throw in a, a, dis, a fundamental disagreement on principle. I think it's, it's a fundamental axiom of, of America that Americans should be able to travel where they want. Yep, it's not for the United States government to tell Americans where, where they can or cannot go. If Castro doesn't want to let them in, that's his business. I'm not, I don't want to defend drunken college students particularly. That's, but, that's what you're doing. But, well, it is what I'm doing USA because indeed, I think, I think from, the, from, the, from the standpoint of their rights as Americans, they should be able to go where they want. The other country doesn't have to let them in. That's the other country's problem. It shouldn't be our policy I agree. to restrict their travel. I, I, no, I agree with that. But the reality of the situation is, I mean, if, if we, you know, if you want to lobby for drunken college students to change the name of USA I'm, hook up. Oh, um, <laughs> The um, <laughs> but you're not. So I mean, the, the reality can I make is, a, is can, can I make a, uh, I mean, can I make a, I need to make a comment. There, there are members in this audience who are college students, and and I want I want to make sure. I, I think I want to stop. I want to stop. I I think the comment about drunken college students in Cuba is totally out of line, uh, because there are a lot of college students, many of them in this room, that have come to listen to this conference to learn about Cuba. Um, so I, uh, my, uh, I apologize, but I, I think that uh, I give more credit uh, to college students today than those that we see on TV. In, on, but that, in those are educational exchanges, though, Jorge. No, no, I'm, not, I'm talking about the reference of college. Let me get. Let me. Uh
change the, the paradigm then in terms of not using college students. But uh, we, we do know, and, and I think you alluded to this earlier, that Cuba does not have the hotels or the infrastructure. And we need to be very clear that when you're talking about this policy, we're not talking about a monolith. Uh, Cuban Americans traveling to Cuba can be a very positive destabilizing effect, and that's what is feared by, by, by the Cuban government. Cuban Americans obviously speak the language. They will go and stay with their relatives. They can be ambassadors of you know, the, the opportunities that are available when one lives in freedom and in a market economy. However, uh, and I'm not going to use Cuban students, but Cuba does not have the infrastructure. So cruise ships going from Miami or from Fort Lauderdale into Havana, which are controlled, and the tourists get out and buy some little f items for the Cuban tourists and go back into the ship, those <laughs> are not the kinds of ambassadors that will tend to spread democracy in into Cuba. So, so we got to be very uh, creative how, how, we th how we think about this. But my point is this, and, and uh, I'm only an academic recently. I spent all my life in the, in the business world, and uh, in fact, uh, I spoke uh, recently in, in, in South Florida to a very large group of about 200 venture capitalists that were very, very interested in investing in Cuba. And um, when I said, well, remember, you do not have a law-based state. And there is no independent judiciary in that island. And recently, in fact, the Cuban government capriciously and arbitrarily decided to confiscate all the bank accounts of businesses in Cuba. Well, when they came to the conference, they were very excited, and I think when they left, they, they were not so excited. But, but it's, it's important to realize that this is a government that can act at any given time capriciously and arbitrarily in terms of, of, of government. There's another little, uh, I think, misconception. Indeed, companies from um, Spain and, and elsewhere have invested in Cuba in the tourist sector. And I've heard the arguments, well, we're, we're falling behind. American companies are falling behind, and uh, uh, you know these companies are taking the market. Uh, I've had conversations with some of these investors. And uh, one thing that I learned in the venture capital world is you never enter a room that doesn't have an exit. These people, many of them, are, have invested in Cuba with the idea of being able to flip those investments to American companies when the time comes. In the same manner that we know that people buy internet domains that they can sell to someone that may want it later, when the time comes that you know Marriott could in, uh, invest in Cuba, some of these people have invested to be able to flip that investment, not because they want to remain in Cuba for, for the, the long term. But the point in terms of negotiating uh, and in terms of the embargo, there will be a biological solution to the Cuban problem within the next few years. There will be a biological solution. And those in line, Machado Ventura or Ramiro Valdez, are also octogenarians or in that age bracket. So in the foreseeable future, within the next decade, there will be a younger, hopefully, generation of Cubans. And I think it behooves us to retain, to keep in our pocket the tools to be able to negotiate. Again, one thing that, that you learn in the business world, if you sit down at the negotiating table with nothing in your pocket, nothing to put in that table, you're most likely going to get off that table empty-handed. So if at some point we may want to influence a post-Castro regime, it would behoove us to be able to have something to put in the table. And so we, we can think in those uh, strategic terms. Thank you. Any other questions? Please, Mark. We have to give shorter answers, I think. Okay. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> we'll wait for the microphone, please. And uh, uh, Two quick questions, uh, one for Chris. Um, getting to, uh, to the issue of telecommunications, which you talked about. In terms of the prohibition in the Cuban Democracy Act about uh, not investing in Cuba's uh, tel uh, domestic uh, telecom sector. Uh, how significant is that for uh, a factor uh, in future U.S. Uh, 
Cuban telecommunications links, and for U.S. investment in the, in the sector. Uh, and second is uh, for Jorge, um, in light of the Gulf oil spill, um, in terms of Cuba's uh, safety standards uh, if, or regime that it might have, uh, what can you tell us about that? But for, for the sake of time, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, we have a question here and a question back there. Let's first address. Yeah, no, you wait for the microphone, which is, yeah, it's right here, and then we'll. Emilio Adolfo Rivero, New Cuba Coalition. And I have a question. I have a question for the members of the panel. It has three points. You all remember the Barbados call of the German miracle on their aircraft. And some talk about a possible Cuban miracle. As to this, I want to remark two point, uh, three points. First, we are not Germans. <coughs> Second one, Germany had to employ enormous amounts of money to compensate for slavery li labor and for those who were killed, assassinated during the, during the Nazi regime. Enormous amounts of money. Enormous. And the third point that I want to mention is that many of the things that have been done in business with Cuba have been illegal and have been denounced international. Why? Because the workers have not been able to negotiate directly with the Cuban government. So this has been denounced. Now, what is your solution? What do you suggest of the enormous amounts of demands that are going to may be made to the Cuban government? The losses in business, the losses of opportunities for the workers, and the death occasioned by the Cuban regime. Thank you. One last question over here. Oh. Yes, Lee Joseph Irwin, Louisiana State University in Shreveport. My question is, uh, what is the difference between our relationship with Cuba and their embargo and our relationship with China? It seems that we benefit more from our relationship with China, or do we uh, just say it's okay to trade with that country who has, seems to have the same human rights policies as the Cubans, but uh, we seem to trade with them more? Is it debt-wise or... I don't understand that. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Good question. I, 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 can, I can tackle it. <laughs> Whatever you want. No, Why don't you start? I'll by, start uh, first. Um, I'll go through quickly. On Mark, on the question of telecoms and uh, Helms Burton, first of all, there are two issues there. One is uh, when the president made his announcement, he talked about changes for the private sector to allow for um, uh, that would be sufficient to allow for independent telecommunications activities. I don't have the language in front of me. Um, to, to, to improve communications for, for Cubans with the outside world. Sufficient. What does that mean? They've clearly fallen short. Now, and what that means is that wasn't pushed through to its logical conclusion, uh, which is it may need revisiting, may require revisiting the issue of, of infrastructure um, that you're talking about. The second is, according to people in BIS, uh, they're even including handsets, cell phones, as, as infrastructure, um, oddly enough. So um, uh, there's a third issue, too, which is that infrastructure shouldn't be benefiting the Cuban government. And again, there's an argument here. Maybe it's too clever by half. But you know, by setting up cell phone towers and routers and switchers, will it benefit the Cuban government? Sure. It'll improve communications. Would it benefit more Cuban citizens who could have access to uh, the outside world? Much more. So I think there's a way around it. And, and, and actually, President Obama began to give an indication of that. Um, on the question of workers, I'm actually going to defer to my friend and uh, uh, um, colleague, former colleague, uh, Joel, who's going to talk about workers' rights. You're absolutely right. Uh, the conditions for workers and the violations of workers' rights have been abominable. And the question is, is sort of how you turn the corner and how you can even improve them in the short term. And I think it goes to the point, even 
which Jose talked about is, you know, do we want to see the embargo lifted wholesale in a way that will actually worsen labor rights? And it could if you allowed um, willy-nilly U.S. investment in ind industries in which uh, labor rights are being uh, grossly violated. Um, last, on the issue of China, there are a couple differences on, on uh, U.S. and uh, Cuba and China. And I'm, I'm not even talking political. The first one is China actually, there is a space for private investment in China that doesn't exist in Cuba. You invest, invest in Cuba, you invest with the government. Um, almost everything is either majority owned or completely owned by the Cuban government, and that does not exist in China. So there, there's, there's that element, first of all. Second of all is, is basically the element of, of um, labor rights violations, while abysmal again in China are not. I mean, Cuba really is the worst of the worst, um, and that really drives it. And then the third is just sheer raw economics, and that is China's a much bigger market, and so there's a much greater incentive uh, to allow for investment, yes, uh, given a, a market, the size of that market to invest. So those are my uh, comments. Well, uh, and I'd like, I like to th uh, thank you, I think that was an excellent question and an excellent response as well. Uh, but following from that, there is an argument that is often made that economic engagement leads inexorably to political change in that country down, down the road. If you look at the data, the data are very clear. Uh, China and Vietnam have, uh, particularly China, uh, introduced profound market reforms for now 35, 36 years <coughs> now with absolutely no movement on the political front. If you look at the Freedom House Index, it rated a seven back then, which is the worst uh, from a one to seven scale, after 34 years of profound uh, economic uh, reforms is still a seven when, when it comes to political uh, and civil liberties. So the argument that economic engagements will lead inexorably to political reforms is, is, a flawed, is a flawed argument. And second, I will submit to you that indeed U.S. foreign policy has not been uniform throughout the world. No question about that. However, in this hemisphere, in this hemisphere, U.S. foreign policy for the last uh, three decades or, or so has been very firm, very consistent in not supporting dictatorships and not supporting totalitarian regimes. I am not sure what the message is then if we now say, okay, but in the case of Cuba, we're going to make an exception into this hemisphere, and we have insisted on democratic governance throughout the hemisphere, but I don't know, Cubans on the survey or, or something. So <coughs> we, we, it's a great question, but uh, there's all kinds of arguments that I can be developed on that. Um, on, on the oil, uh, now with the Discovery Horizon, might not be a, just a follow correct or, or the answer that you want to hear, uh, but both Minbas and Coupet really have very little to do with any of the offshore activities, just like the U.S. government has very little to do with the offshore activities. Uh, the companies that are responsible for drilling offshore are companies like Repsol, Statoil, or Hydro, um, Petrobras, companies that already operate in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so the expertise, and again, my, my, my comments now after the Discovery Horizon might be a little bit shallow, but again, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Repsol just finished the Buckskin project back in September, about 280 miles uh, south of Houston, at a depth of 27,000 feet, and, and that well was completed by, by Repsol. So again, the international oil companies that are operating in Cuba are international oil companies that have expertise in deep, in deep water exploration and production. Uh, the Cuban government doesn't play any role whatsoever uh, in, in, in what they do. Uh, the issue is going to be, are these companies going to have access uh, to what, you know, emergency equipment and supplies and everything that they need uh, in the case of, of, of an incident? Uh, that, that is the question. Let me, uh, on the China, uh, the fellow that asked the China question, I usually stay away from this. Let me read uh, a comment here real quick. It's just a, a statement. We believe open and fair trade is one of the most efficient tools for generating prosperity and social justice. It generates growth. It creates jobs. It promotes peace and stability. It's a win-win proposition for both trading partners. The goal of trade, 
is to help put into place effective laws which, that will increase transparency at all levels and promote the inalienable rights of citizens. Among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that are the foundation of a strong and prosperous society. This is literally a statement uh, from our Cuban-American friend, Carlos Gutierrez, U.S. Secretary of Commerce, on November 6, 2007, in Hanoi, Vietnam. Thank you very much, Jorge. Our